So you guys probably remember learning this in elementary school or middle school or high school. I actually learned this in high school, but some of you, at some point you learned during your life that in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and we all give credit for Christopher Columbus being um, the true, uh, the first discoverer of America. And this is where we, we give him credit for that. You know, we have Columbus Day here in America and that kind of thing. But is he really the first discoverer of America? Think about it. When he lands in America, who does he see? Because he sees other people there. So how can he be the first discoverer of America when there were other people in America already? And that's right. These are the natives. This is A Pushless. The A Push podcast, which requires no effort. There is no homework, no textbook readings, no even primary source document readings. Oh, none of that. You can spend some time learning the history of the United States and not have to try at all. I am your host and fellow student, Trevor Bushnell. So before any European nations come and colonize the Americas, the natives were here living uh, in the land of Americas. Now, there were the, as the natives were here, they developed a wide variety of different social structures, political structures, and even economic structures. Um, before the Europeans even arrived on the scene, they were really, really clever. Um, they grew out of various interactions between the natives and their environment. You'll see that throughout this episode, the environment affects how the natives live um, as well well as what what they do to you know survive and that kind of thing now as the indians migrated over to uh, north america they developed a great diversity of complex social structures now in order to create those they had to adapt to the environment and transform their lifestyle in order to do that let's start with I and mean, we're going to be looking at the natives that are mostly in the united states um, so let's take a look at the southwestern part of the United States. So think about that. You know, you have you picture the United States in your mind. You got your compass, everything. All right, south is down, and every so like we're okay. So we're thinking we're down here. You know, Arizona, that kind of thing. Um, now down there, down that area, life was centered around a crop that was known as maize. We know maize today. We actually eat maize today, but we do not call it maize. We actually call it corn. Um, and this spread, this this crop spread from Central America and around the Mexico area, um, and then it eventually made its way uh, up to North America. Now, this cult of this cultivation of maize fostered an economic development as well as social diversification uh, among the na- natives there. So let's go ahead and talk about the Pueblo peoples that lived there and used um, the maize to their advantage. They're also called the Anasazi? I'm not good at pronunciation, but I guess that's another name they go by. So if I butchered that, I'm sorry, but it's not like you're going to get perfect pronunciations for me. Because if there's anything I'm bad at, it, it's vocabulary and pronouncing the vocabulary. But that's not what this episode, that's not what this show is about. Anyway, the Pueblo peoples, as they're mostly, most likely known, live in the southwestern United States, as we've talked about before. Now, they're named the Pueblo peoples because they happened to live in small towns, and these small towns that they lived in were called Pueblos, hence the name. Uh, their culture developed around 900 AD, so we're talking after the death of Jesus Christ, um, around the Four Corners area. If you guys don't know what the Four Corners area is, it's here in the United States. We're talking the, you know, the, the only four states that share a border where you can put each limb in four different states. We're talking Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado, the point where all of those uh, connect. That's about where their culture begins to develop. Now, these peoples were extremely independent on maize. Like, their life was centered around it. Um, and what's crazy is that they developed these crazy irrigation systems in order to get this maize. They, they really worked really hard to get those irrigation systems, get the water flowing in, and make sure that the uh, maize would be able to survive, and that's so that they could cultivate it, so that they could eat it, uh, that kind of thing. They lived in very sophisticated, sophisticated structures. Uh, these structures had about 100 rooms, and sometimes even more than that. So you have a lot of people living in one building. Uh, back, back in the day, apartments? I, 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 I don't know what that was. Um, eventually, they dispersed from the Four Corners because there was a severe climate change there. Uh, they had lots of volcanic eruptions, And they suffered from severe drought in the 13th and 14th centuries. And when you have volcanic eruptions that's destroying 
all your crops in a drought where you can't water your crops. And when you're talking, you're in Arizona and Utah. By the way, Mormons, why? Why Utah? Why have to pick? Why have to pick Utah? Just not that I'm trying to d- d- diss you or anything like that. But like, I always thought there are so many better states. Like California, California's great. What? Why Utah? Utah has the Great Lake. I forgot what it's called, and I wanted to say it's like Salt Lake City. Yeah. So like, you have a Salt Lake. Like. That's kind of cool, but it's kind of lame. Anyway, but in the 14th, 13th and 14th centuries, they suffered from volcanic eruptions and a severe amount of drought, meaning that they could not grow their beloved corn. Oh, what do we do? Well, how about we run away from this place and create conflicts with nearby tribes? And that's exactly what they did. They uh, created conflict because they would start to live with these other tribes, specifically the Zunis and Hopis of New Mexico, and as well as other communities in the Rio Grande Valley. Now, this movement of moving towards these different um, peoples was known as the Great Migration, and it led the Pueblos to abandon their sophisticated towns that they developed over centuries of civilization and just completely ditch it and join other groups of civilization, which eventually weakened the Pueblos by the time the Europeans came around. Bye-bye, Pueblos. Nicely done, guys. That's That was, that was great. All right, let's go ahead and move up to the Great Basin. Um, now, the Great Basin is just that. It's a huge basin, and the reason they call it is because the natives there had to develop very mobile lifestyles because there was... A lack of natural resources. How about I exaggerate a little bit to make this a little more interesting? There were little to no natural resources. So, of course, you have to develop a mobile lifestyle because eventually you're gonna run out of everything in that one place. You're gonna be like, oh, guess we're gonna die. That's what the dumb people say. But the smart ones are like, no, let's go somewhere else where there's more resources. And they go there and they're able to survive there. Now, what exactly is a Great Basin? It is 400,000 square miles of area that is between the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevada Mountains. That's about where the Great Basin is. Now, what's great is that there was a great amount of environmental diversity, which, you know, you take biology, that, that that's good, R- right? I don't, uh, I think. Anyway, so that was a plus, but the problem was that there was a severe lack of natural resources, as I mentioned before. Now, it was quite severe after a rise in temperature about 5,000 years ago that created hotter rig conditions leading to a lot of droughts in West America from about 900 to 1400, which is why we have to develop these mobile lifestyles. Now, these historians and archaeologists that talk about uh, this Great Basin and the natives living in the Great Basin refer to it as a desert culture because, it, well, you're pretty much living in a desert with nothing to help you kind of the idea um yeah uh the desert culture peoples eventually developed basket making more sedentary groups and uh some of them developed even pottery uh and some people that live here in the great basin we're not gonna talk about i'm just gonna say some of the people there uh we got the show 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 we'll go with that uh we got the pie and the oot. Why do you have to name yourself so really idiotic and weird? I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not going to argue with that kind of lifestyle. But anyway, let's go ahead and talk about the Great Plains. The Great Plains, if you don't know, is a vast amount of land that spreads from U.S. and Canada to about the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains. Or, sorry, let me correct myself. It is the area from U.S. to Canada, so up and down, that goes from about the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains. So it's pretty much, we're slicing the entire North America minus Mexico in that general region. Um, now, these were known as the Plains Indians, and they were, they're native, that's, those are the native people in the Great Plains, and they are quite stereotyped by our ridiculous American pop culture. We associate Plains Indians as riding horses and hunting buffalo and wearing headdresses. And, well, let's be perfectly honest, that's how we stereotype all Indians that were back during this time in TVs and movies. I mean, 
Go watch a movie yourself with Indians in them. That's what they look like. All right. I mean, heck, even research books draw them like that. Actually, don't quote me on that because I don't like reading research books. Anyway, um, this stereotype we create has little validity because you think about it. Uh, for those of you that know your world history, we're going to talk about it next episode. But the Columbian Exchange was huge. Now, here's the deal. The Columbian Exchange happened when the Europeans came. And I said at the start of the video that we're talking about the natives before the Europeans came. So how can these people have horses when there's no Europeans? Because the Europeans brought the horse during the Columbian Exchange. You, you, you see the conflict we're running into here. Um, but anyway, they also had a mobile lifestyle of just more on foot. And you had people hunting buffalo, such as the Seahawks. Not like the Seahawks football team. It's spelled S-I-O-U-X. So like socks. Like the Red Sox. I don't play baseball, though. So there's also the Blackfoot, not to be confused with Blackbeard. The Arath- Arapaho. That's kind of fun to say. Arapaho. Uh, uh, anyway. Uh, and the Cheyenne peoples. I think that's how you say that. We're going to go with that. Anyway. These, uh, the, uh, some of the groups of uh, Indians closer to the Mississippi River developed more um, agricultural lifestyles, more stay in place, and these include the Osage, the Omaha, and the Wichita. Those sound like cities, especially the last two. Hmm, we've come a long way, haven't we? Anyway, let's go ahead and look at some eastern societies that are along the Atlantic coast. We're looking at the Atlantic coast southerners with a southern accent. That's not a southern accent at all. I don't know what I'm thinking. Sorry, southerners. I didn't mean to imper- poorly impersonate you. That's not what I meant. Anyway, they developed a mix of an agricultural society and a little bit of hunting and gathering as well. Uh, some of the economic developments that they made fostered development of permanent settlements. Uh, so let's take a look. we got a couple of peoples we're going to look at real quick. Let's look at the Algonquinian peoples. They were a tribe on the east coast of the United States, around the, uh, roughly the St. Lawrence River and the Great Lakes, that area. Which doesn't strike eastern to me, but then again, I'm not good with geography, and I'm teaching this podcast. So, I, I, don't, I don't know. Anyway, they also hunted, they fished, and they also were dependent on maize. God! Gosh darn it, why you have to love corn so much? Mm. Anyway, the Great Lake areas also had a colder, colder climate, which made agriculture really hard, agricultural products really hard to make, and so they kind of relied more on hunt. Way, these people relied more on hunting and gathering and especially fishing because they were in the Great Lakes. All right, that's all I got on those peoples. Let's go ahead and talk about the Iroquois peoples. Uh, anyway, they live in about present-day New York, and they formed the Iroquois League uh, from groups of Iroquois-speaking peoples. I don't know how to say that. So these consisted of the Mohawks, not like the hairstyle, although I hope that they had that hairstyle because that would be really, really cool. The one neat what? Okay, it's spelled like one is in the number and then Ida's. Sounds like Juanita's. 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 I love those chips. Oh my gosh, they're so good. Anyway, Onondagas. Cayugas. Cayugas, I think. And Sinaras. And some other people called the Tus Carroras in the 1720s. But that was way later. We're, we're not. We're just gonna forget about those people. Uh, it was funded back in the. It was funded all the way back to the 15th century, possibly. Historians don't really know. So yay, historians. Anyway, they were created to end fighting between all those groups of people that I just listed, and this uh, cohesion, uh, this grew over time, and eventually became a powerful force um, in pre-contact uh, before Europeans came. So th- they were. It kind of helped when the Europeans came along. Uh, they lived in permanent villages, and they farmed, they hunted, and they fished. And the majority of their food came from farming. Sorry, hunters and fishers, you just aren't good enough. Uh, farmers grew corn, beans, squash, and the three sisters crop. I, oh, oh, those are called, those are with the three sisters crops. They're not even really related that much. They're 
quite different vegetables. And gosh, you two with the corn. Mmm. Whatever. Uh, and this also, these, these peoples were also a mat- matrilineal society. Well, you guys remember back in Europe, there was a lot of paternal societies or pater- patrilineal. Point is that they were from the father's side. Now we're talking the mother's side. These people were a little bit. Well, they were different. Let's just say they were different. I did not mean to sound sexist there. Okay, now I'm just sounding like an idiot. Okay. Uh, let's just end this off by talking about one more peoples. But we're going to shift gears over to the Pacific Northwest. That's where I am. It's very cold there. These these people are probably not going to do very well. But hey, the Pacific Northwest, and we got things like Washington State, where we don't have giant waves because of the stupid islands that are right there. And we have rocky beaches. We don't have real beaches. So yeah, I hope, I think they live pretty well, you know? Anyway, we're talking about, you know, and we're also including present-day California. Why are we including California in this? California's hot. The Pacific Northwest is not hot. I live there. I know this. What? Why are we including California in this? Anyway, they experienced a lot of economic development and social st- diversification by developing a mix of foraging and hunting. Now, some areas, uh, people were supported by vast resources of the Pacific Ocean, and the rivers that flew through there. Let's talk about the Chinook peoples. Um, Not like the helicopter. I think the helicopters are called Chinooks. I'm not the airplane guy. My brother is. I I leave that stuff to him. Uh, They lived along the Columbia Columbia River, the Columbia River, which is present-day Washington and Oregon. Uh, They were made of several groups uh, but they all had uh, the same language, and they forged, hunted, and fished, as I talked about before. They lived in settled communities, which means they had a stationary lifestyle, and they had, well, they had a nice, uh, ec- high, higher degree of economic development and social stratification than the others, because they even had a caste system. They had a caste system. No one else really had, like, a like 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 a settled caste system. Like this is a like a crazy caste system because the higher caste people lived in is- isolated from the lower caste people, which were like the com- commoners. I don't know what I'm trying to get that there. But some of the higher caste people included shamans, warriors, and rich merchants that could come along. And they lived in long houses, which were which have uh, up to fifty people per house. You guys try and compete, guys. But sorry, those pueblo peoples with their hundred plus rooms. You, mm, I, I don't know. I think you're, uh, you're, uh, you're losing out there. We'll be discovering the end of this episode once you really quickly discover this. A Push Less is brought to you by Google Sites. As you can tell by this side project podcast of mine, I like creating new projects and podcasts because, you know, I kind of like podcasting as a hobby. It keeps me busy and entertained and, well, when you take a class like A-Push, that's kind of nice to have something like that in your life. I also, since I'm treating this like a hobby, don't really have any money to dedicate to this project, so I need a way to get my ideas out for free. And this is where Google Sites comes into play. Google Sites is similar to any other website creator, such as Weebly or Squarespace, but Google Sites has its own quirks that makes it special, aside from the rest of them. Now, aside from purchasing a domain, Google Sites is completely free, outpacing Squarespace in that regard. And the other thing is that there aren't any upgrades for you to purchase, which Weebly makes you upgrade in order to put in elements such as audio. Their easy-to-use interface makes everything so, well, easy. You can attach any file you want, including audio, (laughs) haha, take that, Weebly, and inserting things like text boxes and new pages are quite simple. You can also insert gadgets for free, which are special objects that can aid you in certain ways. For example, you can add a gadget that, when clicked on, subscribes to your YouTube channel or follows you on Twitter. And right now, my listeners can check out my Google site today. Go to sites.google.com forward slash site forward slash a push less. That's all lowercase to get episodes, show notes, and resources today. And that, my friends, are all the native Indians that were around in the pre-European times, roughly about the time that Europe's going to come in. And, well, you'll find out later. But Europe is going to do some interesting things to these people. They're going to colonize the Americas, and then they're going to, quite frankly, abuse them, take their property, and indirectly kill them. And I... I, it's kind of a brutal scene. You'll find it out next episode when the Europeans come along. But aside from that, that's the natives. 
A Push Less is brought to you by SoundCloud and Google Sites. The thing to learn when learning the AP in this podcast is to, one, learn the history of the United States, and two, get SoundCloud, because that will make both, both aspects will make your life way cooler in the end. Trust me. Um, producers on the show this week were only me, Trevor Bushnell. I'm currently recording this on vacation, so I don't have access to my entire team that puts this together, but trust me, this podcast is going to sound a little bit better. It's going to feel a little bit better, have a more upbeat attitude, um, and a couple episodes later. Um, but in the meantime, we are based out of the beautiful, lovely, quaint, quiet, small town of Ferndale, Washington. But of course, you don't know where that is, so look it up on a map. Except, gosh darn it, we still aren't on the map, aren't we? <sighs> Sad. Anyway, thank you guys so much for listening to another episode of A Push Less, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.